que é membro da University of Stanford e que tem trabalhado com estudos econômicos de questões ligadas à educação, com uma experiência no Brasil, principalmente no Nordeste, e tem trabalhado com questões muito importantes como tamanhos de turmas, por exemplo, é, com a questão econômica e com o rendimento dessas turmas, a questão da qualidade do professor, no, avaliada como uma métrica que é o aumento é, do desempenho dos alunos diretamente, qualidade de educação e crescimento econômico re, re, regional. Enfim, é uma experiência muito, muito interessante. Eu like to thank you for coming to the conference. It's a pleasure to have you here. And, uh, e também a, a aproveitar a oportunidade para agradecer à Academia Brasileira de Ciências e ao doutor Luiz uh, Davidovich, nosso presidente, e também o professor Tanab, por essa bela programação que nós estamos assistindo aqui, um momento muito importante para uma reflexão e para ações né, na nossa pauta nacional. Então, nós vamos agora... E nós, ele me disse que teria um tempo para algumas questões, nós teríamos ao final aí umas duas, três questões, como a mesa anterior, para é, dar sequência ao, ao raciocínio que ele vai desenvolver aqui conosco. Please, it's your time. Well, I, I'm very honored to be here at the meetings of the Academy of Sciences. I thank President Davidovich and Professor Watanabe for having me and all the members uh, of the new academy. When I agreed to come and talk to this assembly, I was not told that the academy was going to produce a national strike for education and to... Uh, prepare people for my talk, um, and I'm honored that uh, there's a national strike to commemorate my talk. Um, I really today want to talk about a number of things that were already introduced this morning of having to do with the uh, sustainable development goals. What What we've seen um, oh, since 1950, uh, 2015 is a picture that shows 17 goals for the world and goals that are hoped to be accomplished in the year 2030. These are very ambitious goals that include eliminating poverty, making sure that everybody has sufficient food, improving the uh, earth and making sure that the environment is sustainable. What I'm going to argue today is that two of these 17 goals are in some sense more important than the other 15. Not more important in terms of the value we place on them, but that they are essential to, in fact, accomplishing the other 15. In particular, I'm going to argue that economic growth which is goal number eight, is essential to provide the resources to allow for the accomplishment of the other 15 goals. And then I'm going to argue, and the main point of my talk today is that sustainable development number goal four, goal number four, is in fact the only way to get economic growth, is improving the schools. And I'm going to bring this down to the local scene in Rio, because I'm going to talk a lot about Brazilian education today, or in fact, what improvement in the Brazilian schools would mean for the future of Brazil, and in many ways, the ability to deal with the pro other problems that were discussed earlier this morning in, in the scientific issues having to do with health and with water, clean water, and sanitary conditions and so forth, but that 
these are only going to be accomplished, in my opinion, if in fact there is an improvement in the schools in Brazil. So in many ways, as I say, this fits in with the strike that is going on in the environment around us because it's all a battle about what the future will look like. Now, let me start with the conclusions. I always do this, particularly in talks that are around the lunch hour, because people tend to drift off for the lunch hour. So I want to make sure that you understand the conclusions, and then I'll, I'll fill in the details as we go along. The first conclusion is what I've already said, is that development equals growth. There is no other way to develop without having economic growth because otherwise you are at the current position and you are hoping to maybe redistribute the existing resources, but that turns out to be politically infeasible in many cases. And that um, the other thing that becomes apparent is that in this time of turmoil, <coughs> There's political turmoil in Brazil. There's concerns about the fiscal situation in Brazil. It is much, much too easy to push off things that have to do with the long run. And the long run has to do with developing the skills that are necessary to, in fact, get to the growth that is needed in the, long, in the future. So it is much too easy to put all of our attention on today's issues and forget about the future, which is entirely dependent upon the skills of the population. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to give you is a story here of the economic value of schooling. This is not the only value of schooling, the economic aspects, but what I'm going to show you is that there are enormous implications to uh, improvement of schools in Brazil. And I should say at the beginning, I'm going to talk about Brazil all along, but I give virtually the same talk in the United States because this is a situation where countries around the world have to face up to the fact that if they are going to grow in the ways that they want to, it has to do with improving the skills of the population. Thirdly, I'm going to mention that and show that uh, some examples to try to make the case that improvement is possible. We have seen other countries of the world that have shown that they can change the schools and it can be done here in Brazil, it can be done in the United States. Uh, but that improvement takes a sustained commitment. You cannot have Let's do something this year, but let's next year forget about that because we have other fiscal problems and so forth and not continue with attention to the schools. So let me start with um, something before the sustainable development goals. There were the Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals uh, were ratified by the United Nations and in 2000, they said in 2015, they had a more limited set of goals and the goal of having to do with education said that everybody should essentially get lower secondary schooling or to, at the verge of secondary schooling. And in fact, um, here's, here is a picture that is in 2012 of the proportion of students who are getting into secondary schooling, who have finished lower secondary schooling. And what I've shown you is uh, from Ghana, where less than half of the students at age 15 will still be in schools. And it goes on up until you get to the OECD countries where essentially all of the students are in schools. And what you see in the middle in darkened country lines is Brazil. Now these data are a little bit old, but this was in fact the backdrop for developing the sustainable development goals also because in about 2012, 
the United Nations and, and many people around the world realized that the Millennium Development Goals were not going to be reached by 2015, so that there was the development of a new set of goals for the next 15 years, and that's the Sustainable de Development Goals. Now, the reason why we have had this uh, in the Millennium Development Goals was a picture that I'm going to show you in, in two different forms. This is a picture that on the horizontal axis shows years of schooling. I'll explain conditional in a minute. And on the vertical axis has long-run growth rates. These are growth rates over the period 1960 to 2000. So it has to do with the long-term development of countries. And what you see is that there is this positive relationship between the years of schooling and growth. Now, conditional is just that in the background of this picture, I've allowed for the fact that countries start at different levels of development. If you start behind in development, it's easy to grow fast because all you have to do is copy what everybody else is doing. If you start ahead, it's harder to grow and because you have to invent new things and change the way you produce uh, things. Um, so that's in the background. But the, you see this nice positive relationship between years of schooling and growth. And this led to a push by the United Nations, by the World Bank, and by other international organizations to expand the access to schooling. And in fact, access to schooling expanded dramatically over the period of the Millennium Development Goals. But it also led to a number of disappointments that the economic growth did not seem to follow with the expansion of access to schooling. And there was a reason for that. The reason is that the other part of this graph that you don't realize is that it's entirely wrong. The right graph, the right graph is, um, if I get the right instrument here, the right graph is this one that measures, I have test scores instead of years of schooling and economic growth. And what it is doing is measuring the quality of learning that goes on across countries. And it turns out that this graph, first, all the countries are closer to this graph, uh, to this line, this line. It turns out that you can explain three quarters of the difference in growth rates around the world by simply measuring what people know. Now, these are the test scores that I think many of you realize are the PISA scores or, or the equivalent of Tim's scores. And you can think of these uh, for some time now, up about 50 years. We have taken a set of math problems, translated them into local language. So we have a Portuguese version, we have an English and a Spanish version. And we march these math problems around the world and see how many people can answer these questions. It turns out that that is a good indicator of the skills that are important for an economy because people that can answer these math questions or the equivalent science questions or who can do the reading parts of these tests, in fact, are more skilled in the things that are demanded in the modern world and they affect the future growth rate of the country. The thing that is also less apparent from this picture, um, when I, it looks a lot like the last one I showed you, that is a very steep line. I'm going to show you just how steep that is in a minute. But let me show you first back up and, and talk about the previous picture that I had that I said was all wrong. Oh, I forgot to tell you. There's Brazil, by the way, that is sort of low on test scores over the period 1960 to 2000 did better than the average. It's above the line. But there's no indication that, in fact, Brazil can continue to be above the line without improving its schools. Um, so let me go to the picture I showed you at the beginning that drove the Millennium Development Goals. 
that showed this positive relationship between years of schooling. And let me show you the same picture after I allow for what people learned in schooling, after I allowed for their test scores. And what you see is it's perfectly flat line. That it, we cannot predict growth rates with years of schooling once we allow for what people learn. It took me a long time to understand this graph, I should tell you. Uh, it didn't make much sense to me until I thought for a minute, and, and it, what it really says is, if you go to school and don't learn anything, it doesn't count. And that's the full answer. So let me give you a quick beginning of the discussion of Brazil. Here are Brazilian scores on the PISA test, the OECD um, uh, program for international, assess international student assessments, or PISA. And what I have, the green line is uh, scores on reading, Portuguese test. The blue line is math, and the um, uh, red line is science. And to me, it, there are two different periods here. If we look at 2019 and look from 2000, the beginning of the test, to 2019, what you're seeing is an improvement in the schools as measured by these PISA tests. But when I look at this picture and I look at after 2009 through 2015, it looks to me like things are going down in Brazil. Now there's another set of tests, the 2018 PISA test, where the scores will be announced in this December, um, and it'll be interesting to see whether that there's a continuation of this line and what to make of it. But for now, it looks to me like uh, no indication that Brazil is continuing on a course that is important for future development. Now, let me talk about the economic value of doing well on these tests. It's not doing well on these tests. It's developing the skills that are proxied by these tests and developing the skills in the population in general and talking about what that would mean. What I'm going to do is take the previous picture about the, um, uh, the way that test scores translate into growth, and I'm going to use that picture to project out future improvements in the Brazilian economy if, in fact, the schools improve in various ways. So this is the, the picture that forms the basis of this. We know that without changing the schools, the Brazilian economy will be expected to continue growing at, at some rate. Things keep getting better. Why? Because there are new things being invented, they're introduced into the economy with the current skills of the workforce, productivity improves, and you would expect something um, that looked like uh, this picture, which I'm going to do some projections starting in 2015 and not completely current, and on out for the rest of the century, basically. Now, what I'm claiming is that the previous relationship between test scores and growth rates allow me then to predict out what would happen if in fact there was an improvement in the labor force of Brazil as represented by the schools getting better and these smarter kids becoming more and more important in the labor market and over time the growth of Brazil would be expected to improve. Now what I'm going to do is simply take the difference in these, take the difference between the level of the GDP in Brazil that could be expected without any improvement in schools and the level that could be expected with improvement in schools. And I'm just going to add up that difference and show you what it means for some different feasible improvements in the Brazilian school system. Now, this picture is important for the following reasons, and I'll uh, come back to this, 
if you change the schools, you don't get instant response. Why? Because the kids are still in school. And you're not going to get any response till the kids that become adult workers are in the labor force, and the labor force is better. So it takes time. It also takes time for the economy to adjust to the fact that there's a more skilled labor force and that with this adjustment, productivity will go up and the economy will get better. And so that's what I'm highlighting here. But in all the cases that I'm going to give you, I'm going to calculate what's the value today. I'm going to get the present value. I'm going to weight things today much more heavily than things in the future because some of us aren't going to be here at the end of the century. Okay? Um, and we're going to get the uh, current value of that. Now, let me give you a couple scenarios. Let me give you two different projections that seem reasonable to me. One is that the Brazilian schools move up to the current level of Mexican schools. Okay. So within region, uh, country in Latin America that does better than Brazil. Okay. What would it mean if you moved your schools up on, in general to the Mexican level? And secondly, I'm going to talk about what I'll call universal basic skills. And I'll explain that as a, a standard that I think is represented by the sustainable development goals. So here's a large picture that I'm sure that only the uh, people in the front row can actually read. It's made for that. This is, um, on the vertical axis, is scores on the PISA math and science test in 2015. On the horizontal axis is arraying the countries of the world that took the PISA test in 2015, starting with Singapore and Taiwan and Monk Macau and Japan and Finland and Canada, and going down to the Dominican Republic. And what the first thing I'm going to do is show you what would happen if Brazil moved up to Mexico. Brazil is not at the top of the PISA rankings. Neither is Mexico. But Mexico is, as you can see by the height of these graphs, a little bit ahead, 25 points ahead on the PISA test or a quarter of a standard deviation of the PISA test. Okay, so what does the historical growth pattern suggest that the value of that is, of having Brazil move to Mexico. The numbers are, in present value terms, where I've weighted today much more heavily than the future, in present value terms, the difference between those two curves is 260% of the current GDP of, of Brazil, over two and a half times the current GDP. And it's, you get a number in US dollars of $4 trillion. Now, there's nobody that in this room, including myself, that has any idea what a trillion dollars is, right? I mean, it's, it's a large number, OK? But here's an example of what it means. It means that, on average, for the rest of the century, the level of GDP in Brazil is 5.6% higher than it would be with no change in the schools. Or, getting it a little bit closer to what we can understand, that's essentially every worker in Brazil for the rest of the century on average earns 11% more per year. So that looks like real differences to me. If you talked about everybody in Brazil having 11% higher salaries. Now let me show you um, a slightly different picture. By the way, in this calculation, um, what I've done is not assume that any more students go to school. I've just assumed that the current students 
current 15-year-olds in school in Brazil move up to the level of Mexico. Let me talk a little bit broader than that and talk about what would happen if the kids that weren't in school today go to school and if the schools improve. What I'm going to talk about is what I call universal basic skills. I've shown you the picture before that says that um, only 78% of Brazilian 15-year-olds, at least in 2012, were in school. So universal would mean that we move from 78% to 100% of students in school at age 15. Let me talk about the basic skills component. Here I said um, in shorthand for PISA test that we want everybody to be at what we would call level one of the PISA test, which is a score of 420, where the OECD average is 500. Um, currently, 64% of Brazilian 15-year-olds who are in school cannot reach uh, level two. In other words, have level one. Now, what do these levels mean? They're, they're really very arbitrary things, but let me give you an example of, of what kinds of math problems are incorporated in uh, accomplishing level one. For those of you who have paper and pencil there, you might want to take notes here to, to ma solve this math problem. The math problem is the following. I flew to Rio from San Francisco. I paid $2,700 for my ticket to fly from San Francisco to Rio. The exchange rate between the dollar and the euro is 1 to 1.15. What did my ticket cost in euros? Not what you would call a stretch problem for solving. These are 15-year-olds who are in school, and 64% of Brazilian 15-year-olds who are in school cannot reliably solve a problem like that. And so by universal basic skills, I mean what would happen if, in fact, we move to 100% enrollment rate and all of the students in 15-year-olds could reliably solve my exchange rate problem. What would it mean economically? Well, let me do it in, in th three different steps. The first thing I'm going to do is project out what would happen if Brazil met the Millennium Development Goals, that 100% of 15-year-olds were in school at the current quality levels of schools in Brazil. What you get out of that is about 3.5% higher GDP for the rest of the century. So this projects out to um, not being slightly over half of getting to the level of Mexico that I gave you before, of three and a half percent. Now what would happen if I took the opposite side and said, well, let's just assume that nobody new goes to school of the 15-year-olds, but that we improve the quality up to the level of being able to solve my exchange rate problem. That says that the average GDP for the rest of the century in Brazil would be 10% higher. And this basically shows you the difference between the sustainable development goals and the millennium development goals. It says, Kids should go to, go to school, and they should learn something when they go to school. And the final answer is, what happens if everybody, in fact, goes to uh, school by up through age 15, and everybody can reliably solve my exchange rate problem, or similar things in math and science. And there you're talking about the average level of GDP for the remainder of the century, is 16% higher. Okay, or let me summarize it in the way I did before. 
This is, uh, we're, we're now talking about $23 trillion. Again, not something anybody could understand uh, um, that it's so out of sight. But what we're talking about is roughly 32% higher average pay for every worker in Brazil for the remainder of the century, getting to that level. Okay. So what I'm trying to do at this point is to suggest that the improvement in schools is a big deal, that it has huge implications for the future. Now, Brazil is going to be here for the rest of the century, as best I know. It's going to be, um, it's going to grow over the remainder of the century. And in fact, without changing the schools, I would predict that Brazil is going to be roughly at the same level as it is today in terms of, of the uh, economic wealth of the country. Um, it's going to grow some. But that if the schools don't improve, you are in fact leaving a large sum of money on the table, a sum of money that could in fact deal with the health problems that we were discussing earlier this morning, that could deal with access to clean water and sanitation in Brazil. It could deal with the poverty and income prob distribution problems that exist in Brazil by, in fact, expanding the size of the pie and allowing for the, uh, everybody to participate in the economic future of Brazil that's possible. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that um, Brazil is there. It would move up by either of the two improvement scenarios I gave you before, but that there's a large way to go because Brazil still remains substantially behind the OECD average, what Europe and, and other developed countries look like. And so the challenges are going to be there, but that even going part way toward the OECD average, not getting to the level of the OECD average, has enormous, enormous implications for the future of the uh, Brazilian economy. Okay, so how do you improve uh, knowledge capital? Knowledge capital is what I call the the sort of quality adjusted uh, learning and knowledge of the population. So here's a picture that is both optimistic and pessimistic in many ways. What I've done is just taken a selection of countries that have participated in international tests over the last 50 years. And what you see is that some countries like Japan have been high throughout this entire period and have even improved near the end. But you also see some countries like Sweden that are coming along and then they fall off the cliff in terms of performance. Um, the United States is poking along. France has also declined. I think it's fair to assert that Sweden did not set out to learn less in its schools and to have its schools do worse. This is, the, the optimistic side is that it's possible to improve, like Germany um, has improved uh, substantially over the recent period. But it's also possible with a, if care is not taken to have the schools deteriorate. And in fact, I showed you a little bit, not as, not as steep a deterioration in, in Brazil as in Sweden, but a slight deterioration over the last bit in Brazil. What this says is that you can't just say, I'm going to improve the schools and walk away and assume that they're going to improve. It takes careful attention to what you're doing. Um, here, for example, is a picture, these are basically all the OECD countries. On the horizontal axis is how much did these countries increase their spending? This is over the period 
2000 to 2015. And the vertical axis is how much did their PISA scores change over a co comparable period. And so it's relating the change in spending to the change in performance. And what do you see? Well, if you ignore Poland that's right up in the corner, what you see is a cloud. Some countries spent a lot and got nothing out of it. Other countries spent a fair amount and got a lot out of it. And it's all over spread out. So that just putting more money into the schools is not itself a solution. It's how the money is used that is going to be very important to the story. Now, there's been a lot of study of what's important in how the money is used. Um, some of it is controversial. Uh, part of it is controversial for scientific reasons where people object to, or disagree on what's the right science to use to study this. Part of it's controversial just because people don't like the answer. Okay. Um, the latter being the source of most controversy is that people don't like the answer as opposed to um, disagreeing about the science. So what can be done? And I'm going to give you the story that has emerged in the last 15 years. It started with a large number of studies in the United States and has spread around the world and includes some studies in developing countries, including in Brazil. The first thing, thing to do that this, these studies say is improve teacher quality. Um, and I think that most, most of the parents in the room and most of the students in the room would also agree that there's a big difference between teachers and not so good teachers. Okay, so what's the, the, the second thing to do? The second thing to do is to improve teacher quality. And now, the scientists in the room know the third, third thing to do. <laughs> Improve teacher quality. What we found is that the effect of high quality teachers is dramatic. And, um, and the effect of low quality teachers is equally dramatic. I'll give you an example that of a study I did some time ago in the United States. Um, you might say, well, this isn't going to translate to Brazil, but I think it, it might well do it. But looking in a very poor school district within the United States, Gary, Indiana, which was it's near Chicago. It used to be a steel producing city steel production in the United States went down dramatically and this was a city of poor disadvantaged students. When you go into these schools in this area and look at the learning that goes on in different classrooms with different teachers, there's a stunning difference. In particular, if you go into the top schools and the uh, top classrooms in this school district. Remember, all poor kids, um, disadvantaged kids, low-income kids. In the top classrooms, they're learning one and a half years worth of learning each year. They're learning more than is the uh, expected learning gains by 50%. If you go into the bottom schools in that district, I mean, the bottom classrooms, I'm sorry, the bottom classrooms with particular teachers, they're learning half a year each academic year. So depending upon which classrooms individual teachers were assigned to, they could come out with the equivalent of a whole year difference in knowledge in learning. Now, it turns out that that adds up. Um, the estimates, um, I didn't show you in the PISA pictures, 
but the US doesn't do particularly well. They're slightly below the OECD average in performance. And at the top of that picture was, near the top was Canada. Now Canada geographically is just slightly north of the US. Culturally, it looks much the same as the US, um, except that it, the only difference seems to be that it's a lot colder being up north. Um, and Canada is way ahead of the US, sufficiently that the US could get the kinds of gains I showed you for Brazil if it could move to Canada. Now, if you take the estimates that we have of how different our teachers and said, well, if what would happen if we lined up all the teachers in the US according to how effective they are, how much learning goes on in their classrooms? And we start at the lower end and we say, well, let's replace the bottom 1% with an average teacher or the bottom 2% with an average teacher. If I replace the bottom 5 to 8% of the teachers at the bottom with an average teacher, the US could be Canada. And the US could get five times its current GDP in present value for replacing the bottom teachers. Now, this is obviously the controversial part of the talk because as, when you start talking about teacher policies, um, immediately everybody in the audience rises up and says, well, that's really tough. It's really hard to think of changing the teachers because they have contracts, we have labor laws, they, they don't want to, to change. Um, how, do we, how do we do that? And I think that there's, um, I'm going to basically close with one simple suggestion that actually comes from Brazil. Um, and that's to think of setting up contracts with schools for success. And the example that I have comes from Serra, where Serra um, fiscally made an agreement that if the schools improved, more money came to these schools. And what, you, you, what an economist would say is that this is providing the incentives that are needed to get people operating to improve the quality of schools. And it, it's sort of talking about finance policies because in fact, much of educational policy is filtered through the Ministry of Finance. Finance uh, ministers make many of the decisions by how much money is available to schools. And as I understand, part of the strike that's going on around us has to do with questions of finance for schools and fiscal finance. But if I am a finance minister in most countries, um, I look around and say, well, if I just put more money into the schools, I get that cloud I showed you before. It might, I just might be a black hole that absorbs these funds without showing any real improvement. The contract and the incentives, as I understand it in Sierra, is that if the schools improve, then the money comes, so that the Minister of Finance is not supporting the black hole. The Minister of Finance is supporting performance. And it also gives some leverage to the school authorities because if they can in fact find ways to improve what happens in schools, they get the funds. Um, the data I have been given suggests that the Sierra schools have become some of the better ones in the nation, even though this is a very poor state. Um, so um, the economists would say this emphasizes efficiency. I don't, I try not to say that in public because efficiency has a bad name. But what it emphasizes is getting value out of the funding of schools and improving the schools in ways that have the dramatic economic implications 
that I talked about. So let me talk about some conclusions. Um, that there's still, most of the people are still here and not out, but I'll reinforce the uh, conclusions that we had. And that is that development equals economic growth and that one should not neglect the future because of any current fiscal or political turmoil, but keep, have to keep at least a portion of one's attention focused on the long run, and that's the schools. There is too much of a tendency to say, well, we'll get to the schools tomorrow as soon as we take care of today's problems, and then they don't get taken care of. Growth equals skills, period. The future of economies around the world depend upon the quality of the labor force, and the quality of the labor force is uh, the skills that they have, the human capital that's in the labor force. Um, the value of improving schools is enormous. Improving schools is possible, but improving schools has to be a continuous job with continuity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Muito bom, muito bom mesmo. É, nós estamos com o tempo meio apertado, mas duas questões, duas perguntas. Márcia, aqui. E a professora ali. Duas. Márcia, só um minutinho, Márcia. Vai. Can it... Ok? Thank you. I'll ask my question in English. That'll be easier for uh, the presenter. That was really, really interesting. I just, and I agree with a lot of it, I was wondering what you think of the issue of potential distorted effects of excessive focus on standardized testing. My example is a little bit personal. Uh, I grew up in Finland. I went through the Finnish school system that tends to do well, which is a little bit on the decline, but still is kind of high. Uh, my daughter, who is seven years old, is going to a public school in Miami, in Florida. Uh, and uh, there, the funding follows uh, how well they do on standardized tests. Uh, and in March, they did their standardized tests. They spent two months preparing for the standardized tests, uh, seven-year-old girls and boys. Um, and they do that every year. So they focus on that um, instead of other things and learning, and it has a lot of uh, negative consequences. Um, uh, in Finland, I grew up in the school system, teachers were very autonomous, unionized, um, uh, and very autonomous, uh, and the first standardized test I ever did was when I was 23 years old to apply to go to graduate school in the United States. Um, there, and I'm sure you know this, the best and the brightest want to become teachers. So kind of the competition uh, starts there where you just somehow attract the best and the brightest to be teachers and therefore you don't need to use these kinds of perhaps punitive or efficiency controls to get the outcomes you're looking for. Uh, so uh, of course the empirical evidence is astounding and interesting, but how do you address this issue? And my question is pretty much the same. Um, I see that when um, there's an incentive, financial incentive, for better scores and grades. What happens is the teachers and the principals all collaborate to um, make the grades look higher or make, uh, you know, they fake it. And um, we've seen that a lot, and it's, it's the same kind of question that you were asking. Okay. Let, me, let me respond on, this is the question of how you actually design systems that provide the incentives. And much of the discussion comes from the United States where we had a law called No Child Left Behind that emphasized um, basically all students should get up to some minimum level of proficiency, but it did so by using the standard state test. And many schools 
in fact, went overboard in terms of their response to it of, um, as mentioned, of drilling on the test for so long. The story here is that the PISA test, which aren't, um, nobody cares about the scores when they're taking the test. It's not a high stakes test. And they show that the skills that are measured by these standardized tests have economic value because they're proxying other things. There's a, a step behind whether you use those tests themselves to guide the school system and to reward and punish teachers or, or hire teachers, what have you, which is a very controversial subject. My own opinion is that you don't need to use the standardized test if you have an incentive system and go in and ins inspect the schools. Um, there's an example in the United States of Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, which has its own school system. And it's a little bit funny school system because Washington, D.C. is not a state and it's and its operations of its government and schools are actually co controlled by the U.S. Congress. They introduced a law to evaluate teacher performance in, uh, about six years ago and to reward the really good teachers and to fire the really bad teachers. Um, and they did it mainly by having a set of inspectors who came in and evaluated what was going on in classrooms multiple times for each teacher and scoring the quality of the teaching that went on. They use that information. They give very large bonuses to people that are at the top um, in terms of, in, in fact, increasing their base salaries into the future. And then at the bottom end of the distribution, they fire teachers that over two years show that they're in the bottom. Washington, D.C. schools, which aren't very good schools in general, have shown the largest improvement over the last six years of any large city in the United States by, in fact, paying attention to teachers and using uh, that information. And not just standardized tests. They do use standardized tests if they're available, but that's not the majority. There are alternative ways to think of evaluating schools and evaluating teachers. Uh, we don't have the right answer because Washington, D.C. is a very unusual district in the United States. Most districts do not do what they do, but don't have an evaluation system at all. What I'm suggesting in the talk and when I talked at the end is that how you actually design a system to get better performance and ensure higher quality teachers probably differs across individual school systems. It probably differs across countries. Few countries in the world have the culture that is in Finland that says teachers are the best people in the world. Uh, the only other countries that are potentially like that are um, that I know of are Korea and Singapore. Korea does it in part by paying their teachers a lot. Finland doesn't pay their teachers a lot, but Korea does. Um, and it, these things differ, but every other country I know in the world argues that teachers aren't respected enough and somehow we should respect them. Um, but it's hard to just tell everybody, respect your teachers, particularly if you see teachers that aren't very good. Um, so I don't have a universal answer that I'm going to say everybody should become Finland, um, which is hard. You know, it's, it's so cold and other things in Finland. But um, uh, it's, it's hard to do that. But it is, I think, the case that changes are possible Right now, in almost every country of the world, in particular if I talk about these same things around the world, the immediate answer is, oh, it's so hard to change teachers. And what I want to leave on the table is not an answer to how to change the quality of teachers. What I want to leave on the table is, if you're not willing to do that, you are foregoing a, very, a, a lot in the future. And that the amount of gains, 
from getting to the level of Mexico for the kids currently in school seems sufficient to start trying to push against it's so hard to change the, the teachers. In your graph in which you show the percentage of growth and scores, how much time of difference between the measure of the score and the percentage of growth? Because obviously this, the score impacts only in the future. Well, what I tried to show is the, is the growth rate. Um, behind all of this, and when I come into a scientific body, I have to defend one issue, and that is, is this a causal relationship? If in fact, you manage to change the scores, should you expect to see the gains in growth that are shown there? And without going into detail, there are a variety of different ways to, to try to show that this is a causal relationship. Secondly, it, what I've tried to do is, is picture that it's a long-term thing. I don't, it's not quite in the data. It's hard to look at the individual countries we have in the data, but it's mm -hmm. a long-term thing because I'm talking about improving the quality of primary and secondary schools and waiting the 10 years till they're into the labor market and waiting another 20 years until the majority of people in the labor market have these higher skills. So we're talking about um, uh, not seeing huge gains for another 25 years if I change the schools today. And that's the political problem, is that many politicians say, oh, I want something immediate. If I, if I do something immediate, it's got to change. But in fact, the whole sustainable development goals are talking about things that change slowly. We're not going to change the environment or change poverty instantly in almost any place. Um, and we're, we do make decisions in the long run about the environment. Um, and I'm saying that schools should be in the same category, that the current politicians have to have a view of the future of Brazil or, or future of their own country uh, in mind, they're not going to get immediate rewards by saying that productivity s jumped up this year because last year we improved the eighth grade teach learning. OK, it's time to jump lunch tonight. Now, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Harrison.